To better understand the art of tea, let us explore the history of tea. Tea was first imported from China to Japan toward the end of the 12th century by a Zen monk who had studied it in China. He brought not only tea seeds, but the ceremony the Chinese Zen followers performed in offering a cup of tea to their first patriarch, Bodhidharma. Tea then came to be closely associated with Zen. In fact, there is something in the taste of tea that connects the tea man with the transcendentalism of Zen. As I said before, sake leads us to sociability and conviviality and not infrequently even to the animal exhibition of energy it releases. It was in the Ashikaga era that tea drinking as an art came out of the Zen monastery and began to be appreciated by people principally of the samurai class. When the shogunate government lost its control over the feudal lords in the 16th century, Oda Nobunaga proved the strongest and was on the point of unifying the country under his generalship. He encountered a tragic death, however, and was succeeded by Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the ablest of his lieutenants. The work of unification was carried out by Hideyoshi. Both Hideyoshi and Nobunaga were great patrons of the art of tea, which had achieved great development by that time, especially under Hideyoshi. The man who contributed most to this and is properly regarded as the founder of the art of tea was Sen no Rikyu, who lived from 1521 to 1591. One might say that it was no more than a historical accident, but to my mind it was inevitable that the life of Rikyu came to illustrate all the contradictions and tragedies, the aestheticism and heroism, absurdities and rationalities buried in the abysmal depth of emptiness. Rikyu happened to be born in the period of political chaos and disorganization. He belonged to the merchant class, whose importance was keenly felt by the warring feudal lords. Gradually and quietly, Rikyu came to perform a secret political function in connection with his artistic genius and personality. He became in time a great friend of Hideyoshi's. Hideyoshi, who acquired a position of power through his superior generalship and political sagacity, was in a way a crude, unlettered warrior, but he seems to have understood the art of tea. The strange thing is that, in spite of the utmost strenuousness in the atmosphere enveloping the whole Momoyama period, the warriors conceived a great taste for tea. They would occasionally seclude themselves in the tea room and, meditatively sipping a cup of tea, breathe the air of quietism and transcendentalism. Temporarily, at least, their minds and in the realm of emptiness. Rikyu, great master of the art, seems to have awakened the spirit in those warlike samurai, who, while to a great extent unlettered, were ever ready to look into a world of great artistic traditions. On the other hand, Rikyu, though of the merchant class, came to be influenced by the spirit of the samurai. He thus came to symbolize at least one aspect of the Japanese life as displayed in the Momoyama period. Where power rules, the slightest suspicion of its infringement is swept away with utmost swiftness. When Hideyoshi was informed, falsely or truly, of a supposed intrigue on the part of Rikyu, the latter had immediately to submit himself to the despot's almighty will. He was to die by his own hand, a privilege allowed to an honorable samurai. The last scene is dramatically depicted by Okakura Kakuzo, author of The Book of Tea, in the following manner. On the day destined for his self-immolation, Rikyu invited his chief disciples to a last tea ceremony. Mournfully, at the appointed time, the guests meet at the portico. As they look into the garden path, the trees seem to shudder and in the rustling of their leaves are heard the whispers of homeless ghosts. Like solemn sentinels before the gates of Hades stand the grey stone lanterns. A wave of rare incense is wafted from the tea-room. It is the summons which bids the guest to enter. One by one they advance and take their places. In the tokonoma hangs the kakemono, a wonderful writing by an ancient monk, dealing with the evanescence of all earthly things. The singing kettle, as it boils over the brazier, sounds like some cicada pouring forth his woes to departing summer. 
Soon the host enters the room. Each in turn is served with tea, and each in turn silently drains his cup, the host last of all. According to established etiquette, the chief guest now asks permission to examine the tea equipage. Rikyu places the various articles before them with the kakemono. After all have expressed admiration of their beauty, Rikyu presents one of them to each of the assembled company as a souvenir. The bowl alone he keeps. Never again shall this cup, polluted by the lips of misfortune, be used by me. He speaks and breaks the vessel into fragments. The ceremony is over. The guests, with difficulty restraining their tears, take their last farewell and leave the room. One only, the nearest and dearest, is requested to remain and witness the end. Rikyu then removes his tea gown and carefully folds it on the mat, thereby disclosing the immaculate white death robe which it had hitherto concealed. Tenderly he gazes on the shining blade of the fatal dagger, and in exquisite verse thus addresses it. Welcome to thee, O sword of eternity, through Buddha and through Dharma alike. Thou hast cloven thy way. Then, with a smile upon his face, Rikyu passed forth into the unknown. Unquote. How would we ever connect the escapism of the art of tea with the tragic ending of the tea master? How could one expect to see the solitary sword of emptiness fly heavenward, killing both Buddhas and Maras, that is, devils, friends and foes, tyrants and slaves. When Hideyoshi once wanted to see Rikyu's morning glories, Rikyu chopped down all the flowers in the garden, and when Hideyoshi entered the tea room, he saw just one single flower in the vase. All the rest was sacrificed for the one, and now even this one was to be sacrificed by the same hands which mowed down the hundred others. But was it really sacrificed? Did it altogether disappear from the cultural history of Japan? No, there still stands the one sword glittering cold against the sky. As I said before, the spirit of tea is poverty, solitariness, and absolutism, which concretizes the philosophy of emptiness. When, therefore, the tea room begins to be filled even with a few people, its spirit is violated, and some regulating principles come to be established. As Lao Tzu says, the great Tao obliterates itself when benevolence and righteousness assert themselves. The tea room is really reserved for one person who, all by himself, sits there with the same spirit which inspired the Buddha at his birth to exclaim, Heavens above, heavens below, I alone am the most honored one. When a second person enters, the one splits itself, and there starts a dualism, out of which we have a world of multitudinousness. The tea room then demands rules whereby somehow the original peace is to be preserved. The art of tea, or so-called tea ceremony, is a degeneration. But this was in fact the way the warriors in the warring period from the late 15th through the 16th centuries learned to get a glimpse into a realm of transcendentalism or of emptiness. The tea room then became a spiritual training station and the art a disciplining technique for the samurai. Generally, the principles regulating the tea room are four. One is harmony, or wa. Two is reverence, or kei. Three is purity, or sei. And four is tranquility, or jaku. The first two are social or ethical, the third is both physical and psychological, and the fourth is spiritual or metaphysical. When one goes over these four items, one will see that here are represented the four schools of Oriental teaching. Confucianism is for the first two, Taoism and Shintoism for the third, and Buddhism and Taoism for the fourth. Harmony, the first, may also be regarded as Taoist, because one of its practical teachings is to retain a harmonious relationship with nature, that is, between the male and the female principles. 
It is due to this harmony that the world goes on forever without exhausting its energy. The baby may cry all day, but it will retain its voice without getting hoarse. The crying is apparently no sign of inharmony, according to Lao Tzu. Therefore, harmony is called eternity or infinity. Harmony is referred to in Prince Shotoku's constitution as the thing most estimable. This is no doubt political, reflecting the state of affairs which existed in his day. Before we proceed further, a few words on this constitution. It consists of 17 articles based on Buddhist and Confucian ethics and philosophy. It opens with a statement about Wa, harmony. The Chinese character for harmony, Ho, also means softness. It also is warmth. As a man stands in the soft, warm, relaxing spring breeze, he is to feel much in the same style in the tea room. In whatever sense the compiler of the constitution wished to have Wa or Ho understood by his subjects, there is no doubt that the tea man's idea of Wa is to see a soft, tender, conciliatory, yielding atmosphere pervading the room. Barring all the arrogant, individualistic, self-assertive spirit, so characteristic of modern Japanese young men. Purity, the third principle, is no doubt Shinto. The hand-washing and mouth-rinsing remind us of ablution. But when it goes beyond mere superficiality and acquires a deeper sense, it touches upon Taoism. In the Tao Te Ching we read that heaven is pure because of its oneness. The purification of the heart is Buddhist but the art of tea is here more concerned with general cleansing and orderliness, which tend to make the mind free from unnecessary psychological encumbrances. Tranquility, which is the last principle governing the art of tea, is the most pregnant one. Where this is lacking, the art will lose its significance altogether. For each particular performance that goes to a successful conduct of the art is so contrived as to create the atmosphere of tranquility all around. The massing of rocks, the trickling of water, the thatched hut, the old pine trees sheltering it, the moss-covered stone lantern, the sizzling of the kettle water, and the light softly filtering through the paper screens, all these are meant uniformly to create a meditative frame of mind. But in reality, the principle of tranquility is something that emanates from one's inner consciousness as it is especially understood in the art of tea. This is where Zen Buddhism enters and turns the whole situation into an intimate relationship with the larger sphere of reality. The tea room is a sense organ for the tea man to express himself. He makes everything in it vibrate with his subjectivity. The man and the room become one and each speaks of the other. Those who walk into the room will at once realize it. Here is the art of tea. The tea man is generally very sensitive to anything jarring in his environment. His nerves are in this respect very well trained, indeed sometimes too well. But to appreciate and enjoy the tea, it is not really necessary to be too critical about such things. That the mind be not concerned with details, let it be in a receptive frame so as to take in the trickling of the water and the rustling of the pine needles, and it will then be able to breathe a spirit of tranquility into all the surrounding objects. Purity may belong to the subject as well as to the object, but tranquility or serenity is a spiritual quality. When the hands are washed and the mouth is cleansed, the physical person of the tea man may be regarded as purified and fit to enter the tea room. But this kind of purity does not ensure his tranquility. Environment has a great deal to do with the molding of a man's character and temperament, but he is also the molder and even the creator of his environment, for man is at once creature and creator. So tranquility is something man adds to his environment from his inner self. The tea room, the roji or garden, the stone basin, the evergreens surrounding the hut, may be most meticulously arranged in every detail to yield the total effect of tranquility, and yet the tea man's spirit may be found wandering somewhere else. 
with this most important spiritual quality wanting, the art of tea cannot be anything but a farce. The art of tea is a syncretism of all the philosophical thoughts that were thriving throughout the Ashikaga, the Momoyama, and the Tokugawa periods, that is, the time from the mid-14th to the late 19th century, the time when the cult attained its highest degree of perfection. If Japan did not produce any philosophical system of her own, she was original enough to embody in her practical life all that could profitably be extracted from Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, and to turn them into the material for her spiritual enhancement and artistic appreciation. The Japanese, we can say, did not develop all the implications of Indian and Chinese thought in such a way as to demonstrate their intellectual possibilities. On the contrary, they strove to melt them into the humdrum of their workaday life, thereby transforming this into something enjoyable on a higher artistic plane. The Japanese genius so far failed to assert itself on the intellectual and rationalistic plane, but can we not say that it was manifested more on the side of the art of living? It seems to me that the Japanese are great in changing philosophy into art, abstract reasoning into life, transcendentalism into empirical immanentism. For this reason, the tea room can be said to be the syncretism of the three great schools of oriental religio-philosophical thought. The Chinese mind is differently constructed. When it came in contact with the Indian way of thinking as represented in Buddhism, it was stirred to the depth of its intellectual powers. It worked out on the one hand the philosophy of Kagon, Tendai, and Sanron, and on the other hand it created the philosophy of the Sung dynasty, known as the Regaku, which is the Chinese elaboration in response to the Zen Kagon interpretation of Mahayana Buddhist thought. The Japanese thinkers so far have not intellectually taken up foreign stimulations, though there are ample indications now that promise a fruitful future for rationalistic thinking in Japan. Ultranationalism has unfortunately set a check on the growth of vigorous original thought among the Japanese. Instead of expressing themselves by free inquiry and healthy reflection on life itself, the Japanese rather sought to escape from feudalistic oppression by such devices as the no dance, the art of tea, literature, and other social and artistic entertainments. The Japanese political system, I think, is to be held responsible for the impotence or lame development of the Japanese philosophical genius. Tranquility is par excellence Buddhistic. The character jaku in Japanese or chi in Chinese has a special connotation in Buddhism. Originally, and nowadays also, jaku means to be quiet or to be lonely, but when it is used in the Buddhist and especially in the Zen sense, it acquires a deep spiritual significance. It points to a life transcending mere worldliness or to a realm beyond birth and death, which men of penetrating spiritual insight alone are able to inhabit. The Buddhist stanza generally found affixed at the end of a Mahayana Sutra reads, All composite things are impermanent. They belong in the realm of birth and death. When birth and death is transcended, absolute tranquility is realized, and blessed are we. In Buddhism, jaku is generally coupled with metsu, and the combination means absolute tranquility. This is frequently understood as a state of complete annihilation or of absolute nothingness, and Buddhists are criticized for their nihilism or acosmism that this is due to the critics not having a clear enough insight into the deepest recesses of Buddhist thought will easily be recognized by all students who have seriously studied this subject. This is not, however, the place for this kind of discussion, and I will make no further comments on it. I have said that the art of tea was discovered as a way of escape from feudalistic regimentation, but it may be better to say that we all have an innate desire to transcend ourselves, whether we are living under a feudalistic political system or in a liberal democratic country. In whatever political and social environment we may be situated, we are ever seeking a new life which looms up before us. Thus urged, we are never satisfied with what we actually have, 
but are forever seeking a new era of culture, and for its creation we never relax our effort. When a new one is found not to be in correspondence with our spiritual needs and to give us no promise for its future development, it is doomed. If the art of tea stopped short at Confucianism and Taoism, it would be no more than a mere pastime, a quiet entertainment for the bourgeoisie, and we should fail to find in it anything contributing to the enhancement of our spiritual life. It was therefore up to the tea man to introduce into the art something of Buddhist metaphysics. He found it in the Buddhist idea of jaku, tranquility, not as an environmental attribute, but as an idealistic disposition which every tea man, if he really desires to recover a vision, ought to cultivate. Tranquility, therefore, in the art of tea, is a spiritual quality transcending birth and death, and not a mere physical or psychological one. This must carefully be kept in mind when the tea is spoken of as a step toward devoting one's life to a higher level from which one is to view our ordinary world and to live in it as if not in it. The following is the view of the tea held by Seisetsu, a Japanese Zen master of the late 18th and early 19th century, the late Tokugawa era. My tea is no tea, which is not no tea in opposition to tea. What then is this no tea? When someone enters into the exquisite realm of no tea, they will realize that no tea is no other than the great way itself. In this way there are no fortifications built against birth and death, ignorance and enlightenment, right and wrong, assertion and negation. To attain a state of no fortification is the way of no tea. So with things of beauty, Nothing can be more beautiful than the virtue of no tea. Here is a story. A monk came to Joshu who asked, Have you ever been here? The monk said, No, master. Joshu said, Have a cup of tea. Another monk called, and the master again asked, Have you ever been here? Yes, master, was the answer. The master said, Have a cup of tea. The same cup of tea is offered to either monk, regardless of his former visit to Joshu. How is this? When the meaning of such a story as this is understood to its depths, one enters into the inner sanctuary of Joshu and will appreciate the bitterness of tea tempered with the salt of sweetness. Well, I hear a bell ringing somewhere. Unquote. Say, Setsu's no tea is a mysterious variation of the tea. He wants to reach the spirit of the art by way of negation. This is the logic of the Prajna philosophy, which has sometimes been adopted by the Zen masters. As long as there is an event designated as tea, this will obscure our vision and hinder it from penetrating into tea as it is in itself. This is particularly the case with what may be called the psychology of the tea. When someone is all the time conscious of performing the art called tea-serving, the very fact of being conscious constrains every movement, ending in their artificially constructing a fortification. They always feel themselves standing against this formidable thing which starts up a world of opposites, right and wrong, birth and death, tea and no tea, ad infinitum. When the tea-man is caught in these dualistic meshes, he deviates from the great way, and tranquility is lost forever. For the art of tea is of the great way. It is the great way itself. This transcendentalistic conception of the art of tea is not to be understood as something undiscoverable in our prosaic workaday life. To interpret the tea in this light is not in accord with its spirit. Tranquility is at the basis of every movement as the tea man takes the powdered tea out of the caddy and stirs it in the bowl with a bamboo whisk. Tranquility is to be dynamically conceived. Otherwise, it splits the mind in two and makes the tea man sit outside himself. The man and the work are bifurcated and the tea ceases to be the no tea. As long as there is any consciousness of a split between act and actor, the opposition causes friction, and the friction builds up fortifications. 
the Prajna philosopher would say, T is T only when T is no T. So long as there is any kind of fortification, there will be no unobstructed flowing. The principle of tranquility which makes up the art of tea will be violently negated. Plotinus had his own way of expressing this idea, as follows. There were not two. Beholder was one with beheld. It was not a vision compassed, but a unity apprehended. The man formed by this mingling with the Supreme must, if he only remember, carry its image impressed upon him. He is become the unity, nothing within him or without inducing any diversity. No movement now, no passion, no outlooking desire, once this ascent is achieved. Reasoning is in abeyance, and all intellection, and even, to dare the word, the very self. Caught away, filled with God, he has in perfect stillness attained isolation. All the being calmed, he turns neither to this side nor to that, not even inward to himself. Utterly resting, he has become very rest. Unquote. The Platinian rest is no other than the tea man's jaku. The Bhagavad Gita's way of expressing this is rather strong and deeply breathes the spirit Rikyu exhaled at his last moment by throwing his sword skyward. But he whose mind dwells beyond attachment, untainted by ego, no act shall bind him with any bond. Though he slay these thousands, he is no slayer. Objectively and relatively speaking, this may stagger some of our listeners. But we must remember that the author of the Gita had his own viewpoint, which evades our intellectually limited measurement. Emerson must have been influenced by this when he wrote Brahma, the first four lines of which run, if the red slayer think he slays, or if the slain think he is slain, they know not well the subtle ways I keep and pass and turn again. Why? Because the poem explains, Far or forgot to me is near, Shadow and sunlight are the same, The vanished gods to me appear, And one to me are shame and fame. Rikyu's sword that opened up his own bowels is also the one that slays Buddhas and patriarchs, saints and sinners, creator and created. When the art of tea reaches this height of enlightenment, the Zen master's tea of no tea is realized. To quote Eckhart, Then how shall I love God? Love him as he is, a not God, a not spirit, a not person, a not image as sheer, pure, limpid one, alien from all duality. And in this one let us sink down eternally from nothingness to nothingness. If I may add an unnecessary comment, to drink tea as no tea, as recommended by Seisetsu, the Japanese Zen master, is no other than to love God as a not-God, to sink eternally from nothingness to nothingness. The principle of tranquility is to be understood in this sense.